as you know, we've got uh, two special guests today. So um, I want to uh, introduce to you first Will McCaskill, who is uh, a graduate student at uh, the University of Oxford in England. He's just uh, about to complete his PhD. He's also a research associate at the Uhuru Center for Practical Ethics, which is a center at the University of Oxford that does research into practical ethics. And he's the founder of 80,000 Hours, which uh, you've been looking at some of the information about that. And uh, he's going to be talking to you specifically about that issue. Uh, Will's going to speak for about 20 minutes with uh, the PowerPoint presentation that's behind me. Then, uh, from uh, rather more in the region, we have Matt Wager, who uh, was a student here at Princeton uh, just a couple of years ago, um, as, as you are, and uh, graduated from Princeton and uh, is now working for an arbitrage firm in New York City called uh, Jane Street, and uh, we'll tell you about the way he's uh, furthering his career and doing good by doing that. So Matt will speak for about 10 minutes, and that should leave us with plenty of time for questions and discussions of the issues that both Will and Matt have raised. So Matt, uh, Will, sorry, uh, over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Peter, and thank you all for coming here. It's an absolute delight to speak for, me, uh, for you all. So as Peter said, I'm the founder of 80,000 Hours. Um, the idea behind this organization is that it aims to help people like you, talented, motivated, um, bright young people, to do as much good as they can in the course of their career. And I'm going to be telling you about just one idea that we've had, um, an idea that's called earning to give. And I'm by no means going to say that this is always the best way to make a difference in the world. But it's one way that you might not have thought of that has a lot more arguments behind it than you might have thought. So we're called 80,000 hours because that's the number of hours you'll typically work over the course of your life. And you might think, whoa, what a drudgery is that? That's such an incredibly long time. Um, but one thing I want to emphasize is that actually, when you compare it to some of the biggest problems in the world, that means uh, global poverty, 1.4 billion people living on less than $1.25 a day, where that means what $1.25 would buy in the US in 2005. So it's already taken into account the fact that money goes further overseas. When you look at the idea that 20 million people every year die of easily preventable diseases, when you think about the um, tens of billions of animals that are um, unnecessarily uh, um, harmfully treated in factory farms and then killed for food, or when you look at the costs of climate change, which will amount to over $7 trillion, you realize that actually the amount of time that you've got to make a difference is absolutely tiny compared to the size of the, the world's most pressing problems. So it's not like you can think, well, which of these problems do I want to solve? Rather, you've got to think, which problem can I make the biggest dent in? Um, so the fact that you've got only 80,000 hours means that you have this really tough question. You have to think, how should I allocate those hours? Which causes should I pursue? Which careers should I pursue? And I'm going to be helping you to answer that question. So first, I'm going to just debunk a little myth. So a lot of people, when they discuss kind of careers that make a difference, it's as if it's easy to do that. Um, there's this very common slogan, you should just follow your passion. Um, the idea is that you'll just discover some cause or some activity that you'll feel is your calling. And then when you pursue that, that's how you know you can make the most difference. And I think that's a very bad piece of advice. And I'll just tell a little story in order to illustrate that. Um, so does anyone know what this is? I'll allow you to shout out if you want. So in particular, it's called a play pump. And in the early 20, um, 2000s, this idea got absolutely huge. The idea is it's meant to be a win-win. So uh, it was a playground merry-go-round that would at the same time function as a, a water pump. 
So it would harness the power of youthful energy. Uh, children would play on it, and in doing so, water would be pumped up and clean water would be provided for the village. Now, this got huge. It was a media sensation. Um, the then First Lady, Laura Bush, uh, she gave $14 million to fund play pumps, um, a figure that was um, nearly matched by the Case Foundation. Uh, it got won a UN World Development Marketplace Award, um, and the media just absolutely loved it. They made puns like, um, solving poverty as child's play, or calling it the magic roundabout. Um, there were just two problems with the idea. The first is that it cost three times as much as a traditional water pump, and pumped less water. Um, in fact, it pumped so little water that uh, children would need to play on it 27 hours per day in order to provide enough water for the village. But the second and even more damning problem is that it just wasn't any fun. So, <laughs> unlike a normal um, playground merry-go-round, the kind of point is that you push it and then um, the momentum means that you can spin freely. Not so with this play pump, uh, because in order to be able to actually pump water, you need a constant, constant torque. So that meant that you had to keep pushing it in order for the water to be, um, to be pumped. This meant that the children would get incredibly tired very quickly, um, and they wouldn't want to play in the play pump, quite understandably, apart from in one village where they were actually paid to do so. So this meant that uh, the, it was often left to the elderly women of the village who'd have to push this play pump uh, many hours of the day, and they'd find the whole process kind of degrading, as you might expect. Um, not only that, it was also kind of dangerous. So um, a number of people broke limbs uh, while pushing the play pump, um, some people would vomit from exhaustion. Uh, so this was an absolute disaster. Um, the best thing that happened about the program is that it admitted uh, it was game over several years later after extensive media backlash and investigation by the UN. But what I want to illustrate with this, um, aside from the fact that good ideas on its face can uh, do very little good at all, is just how following your passion can go astray. So, this is Trevor Field. He was the one who pioneered the play pump. So he was a great example of someone trying to do good through following his passion. Um, prior to getting involved in development, he worked in advertising for Penthouse magazine. Um, so tried to move to something that he thought might have made more of a difference. And in an interview before it was revealed just how disastrous this program was, uh, this is what he gave. He said, you've just got to do it. Um, this was his advice. The most important thing is just you find something you're passionate about that you think is great, and you don't look at the evidence. Who needs that? You just go and pursue this thing that you're really excited about. And this is the sort of reasoning that I really want to caution against. It's incredibly difficult to know how to do good in the world. And so I'm going to answer, try and answer this question you know, by being a bit of a geek, by doing your homework. Um, how much good can you really do over the course of your career if you really try? Okay, I'm gonna give uh, three main points, just three concepts for you to take away with and try to apply to your own career decisions. Um, the first will be the idea of working in effective causes. This is the one I'll linger on, it's the most important in practical terms because some causes are thousands or tens of thousands more cost effective than others. The second is the idea of just getting leverage. It might sound trivial that the more influence you have, the more good you can do, but uh, the implications of that can be unexpected. And then the third is uh, where it gets kind of philosophically interesting is the idea of doing something that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And again, that's a crucial consideration when thinking about your own career. So let's begin with working in effective causes. Um, you think, well, maybe this sounds obvious to, um, on its face, but how do you work out effectiveness? Um, well, the absolute gold standard way of working out what an effective cause is is by using a randomized control trial. So the idea is you've got some drug, some intervention you want to test. Um, you've got your uh, pop target population um, and on the left. In order to work out if something is effective, you divide um, the groups, you divide the population into two groups. You've got your control group. You don't give them the intervention. You've got your intervention group. You give them the drug or whatever you want to test. And then the difference that intervention makes is the difference between um, how well off 
those um, in the intervention group are compared with how well off those in the control group are. And again, anyone who's done empirical science, this should be very familiar, um, but remarkably it's just often left out of um, uh, development. Um, it's actually just fairly difficult to internalize in general. So the reason why quack medicine or kind of pseudoscientific medicine is so popular is um, because people don't think about this. They don't think about what would have happened otherwise. They um, uh, will feel unwell, then they'll uh, take, so in Peru, something called frog juice is very popular. It's um, a mix of aloe vera, kind of native root, and a mashed up frog. And um, they'll take that, and then maybe they'll feel better afterwards. And what they neglect, and they think, oh, well, it was effective then, I felt better. But what they neglect is that they might have felt better otherwise. The analogy in um, development of the world to do good is you might do something and see progress. You just, without a control group, you really don't know whether you would have, um, that benefit would have happened otherwise. In fact, maybe there would have been an even greater benefit if you hadn't been involved, in which case uh, you not only didn't do good, you were actually actively harmful. So that's measuring effectiveness, but you also, what we care about is kind of how good the actions that you're doing are. And how can you measure good? Isn't that inherently subjective? Well, economists have spent quite a lot of work in order to do this, uh, in order to try and work out how different um, interventions and activities compare. And they've used, uh, they have two kind of major metrics. So one is the quality adjusted life year, or quali. And this is the uh, preferred metric of health economists. So the idea is there's two ways I can give you a health benefit. Um, the first is to extend your life. So no one has ever really saved a life. You might start someone's heart, but then lo and behold, um, they'll die of something else a few years later. Um, the only benefit you can really pr uh, provide in terms of saving someone's life is extending their life. And in general, the more you can extend someone's life by, the better. Um, if I saved you out of the path of a bus and pushed you in front of a train, extending, saving your life, but extending your life by only a few minutes, that wouldn't have been much of a benefit. But if I pull you out the path of a bus and allow you to live another 30 years, um, that would be a substantial benefit. So one component of this metric is the idea of giving people additional years of life. Um, so if their life is already good, then extending that life um, by a certain number of years is a benefit. Uh, the second aspect that it incorporates is the idea of making someone's life better off while they are alive. So if you cure, um, treat someone who has a problem with migraines, for example, as a doctor, you won't have made their life um, any longer. Uh, migraines aren't gonna shorten someone's life, but you have made their life better off while they're alive, and that's a good thing as well. And what the quality metric does is use um, extensive survey data in order to work out how the people you're trying to help make trade-offs between having a longer life and having a higher quality of life while they're alive. And then it uses those trade-offs um, in order to um, have this kind of one unified metric of a quality-adjusted life year, where the idea is the more quality-adjusted life years you can give to a population, the better. Um, and so using this, you can compare really quite different interventions. So for example, if you distribute long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets in the developing world. Um, this is in order to prevent uh, children from getting malaria. Then you'll give one quality-adjusted life year, that's one year of very high-quality health. Um, you'll be able to provide that for just $50. In contrast, if you provide, train and provide guide dogs, um, guide dogs are very expensive, cost about $70,000. Um, the amount you're spending in order to give someone the equivalent of one year of very high quality health, um, but this case by improving the quality of their life, is much less than $50,000 per quality adjusted life year. So in terms of the benefits, in terms of benefits of human health and well-being, the difference between bed nets and guide dogs is the difference between um, uh, saving or providing one quality adjusted life year and providing 10,000. So the difference in impact is a factor of 10,000. Now, you can't use quality-adjusted life years to compare everything. They're kind of the gold standard, and when you have randomized control trials, that's amazing. But it's not always um, possible. And economists quite often retreat to the idea of benefit-cost analysis. So this is the idea of simply um, 
looking at how much money is spent on a certain intervention and how much money does that generate. So micronutrients, for example, most uh, malnutrition in the developing world isn't due to a lack of calories, it's due to a lack of vitamins, of micronutrients. And uh, if you um, provide um, supplementation of vitamin A, zinc, uh, and um, iron, then uh, every dollar you uh, spend on this program will generate about $40 in increased income uh, for the people who you're helping. So it's a very cost-effective intervention. Okay, so this is the idea of cost-effectiveness. Um, the most important thing is that you can measure this and that some activities are thousands of times more cost-effective than others. Second big idea is the idea of leverage. So this should sound kind of trivial, but it's very important, which is just simply if you have more power over the world, more resources that you can influence, then um, you, can do, you can use those resources to do more good. Um, this can be unintuitive, so a friend of mine uh, worked at the World Bank for about five years, and he was as a grant maker within the World Bank. He was deciding which programs got funded and which didn't. Within the World Bank, this isn't thought of as the sexiest position. Um, it's somewhere towards an admin role, and he could have got something much kind of more reputable or um, higher status. Uh, but in the course of this um, position, he was able to uh, move about... $500 million to causes that he thought were doing 10 times as much good um, with that money. So by taking this position where it maybe wasn't as high status but had a huge influence over the resources that were being spent, um, he was able to move absolutely massive amount of money to causes that were more effective. The third idea is doing something that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, and I'll introduce this with the beautiful George Clooney. So... Uh, this is a little bit before your time, but this is Dr. Doug Ross in ER, and uh, he's kind of portrayed as, has his ups and downs, but portrayed as something of a moral hero. Um, and doctors in general are, so the idea is they save lives on a regular basis, and that's kind of amazing. But if we ask the question, um, how much good does a doctor do? So how many lives does a doctor save? There's two mistakes that we've got to be wary of making. So the simple view of how many lives a doctor saves would be to take the doctor, look at how many life-saving operations or treatments they perform over the course of their life, um, add all those up, and then that's the number of lives saved. Uh, but that makes two mistakes, and both um, make the mistake of not thinking about what would have happened otherwise, like we saw with uh, the mistake of uh, alter, like quack medicine in uh, randomized control trials. The first is the fact that so supposing uh, Dr. Doug Ross had just disappeared and no one took his place, um, would those life-saving interventions, treatments and operations not have happened? And the answer is they would have happened anyway. Um, life-saving surgeries and treatments are among the most important things a doctor can do. That means that if that doctor hadn't been there, the other doctors in the hospital, and in fact across the whole US, would have compensated they'd have done the most important things that Dr. Ross wouldn't have done, and instead they'd have neglected the least important things, like treating minor ailments. And indeed, there are over 800,000 doctors in the U.S. alone. Um, if you become a doctor, it's not like you're the average doctor. You're adding one doctor. So the difference you're making is the difference in total health benefit, given that the, doc that, given that the U.S. has 800,000 doctors or 800,001 doctors. And that might be... that's almost certainly a lot smaller than um, the figure that you get if you um, just add up how many life-saving surgeries there are uh, over the course of a doctor's career. So that's the first way you can make a mistake. The second way is that, supposing Dr. Doug Ross had decided never to go into medical school. Well, it's simply not the case that um, there would have been one fewer doctor in the country. Rather, if he hadn't gone into medical school, someone else would have done, someone else would have taken the position that he went into. So rather than the difference being kind of all the good you directly do, the difference that he makes is the difference between how much good he does and how much good the person who would have been in his shoes would have done. So supposing he was saving 10 lives every week or performing 10 life-saving surgeries, if the person in his shoes had been, let's say, a lot worse than him and only saved nine lives every week, then the difference he makes... Um, the number of lives that are saved as a result of him 
is only one life save per week. It's not 10. And so taking into account this fact that you've got to look at what would have happened otherwise can often make um, the difference you make much less than you might think. 